though her line of uh, formal research um, is focused on the creation of engineered muscle tissue that can be implanted into patients who have lost their muscle tissue, for example, due to accidents or surgeries, uh, Daisy van der Schaft actually comes from the epicenter of the in vitro meat movement in the world, Eindhoven University. And so far, the labs have only engineered muscle tissue that's very thin, right, Daisy? Right. But I thought if they could apply this technology Absolutely. and lay it layer on layer, yeah. how soon till we are eating Frankenburgers? Frankenburgers. I hope we don't call them Frankenburgers, <laughs> but I hope soon. <laughs> this is Daisy van der Schaff. So, yes, indeed, uh, I'm from Eindhoven, Holland, the happiest place in the world, apparently. <laughs> and uh, I'm talking about tissue engineering of muscle. So we want to make muscle tissue. And we want to make this for making cultured meat, so laboratory-grown meat. And I could have used the title, which we gave to a review paper that we published two years ago, which is called Meet the New Meat. <laughs> so, in a nutshell, tissue engineering of meat, so making of meat in a laboratory, making of muscle in a laboratory, is in principle for different applications. So, oh, sorry, let's go back. So, Meat consumption, that's what I'm going to talk about today, but other applications that I'm working on, actually, are also clinical applications, so making muscle tissue to help patients that have suffered from muscle loss. So, for example, due to surgery, due to removal of a tumor that also damages a muscle, or due to an accident that people lose, lose muscle, patients with muscle diseases, but also to use it as an uh, application in the laboratory to test, for example, drugs or to study a disease. So, in this way, we can save the use of a lot of animals for our studies. But today, let's talk about meat. Cultured meat or laboratory-grown meat, if you look, on the internet, newspapers, articles. Everywhere you will find a lot of different names like Petri pork, test tube meat, lab burger, and vitro meat. I don't know about you, but wouldn't appeal to me to eat it, actually. <laughs> if I look at cultured meat, then I will say, oh, yeah, doesn't sound so bad. <laughs> but Actually, we don't have the perfect name yet. So, if you have any suggestions later on, come on and talk to me. Now, the idea of making laboratory-grown meat. So, in the world, we are working with about 25, maybe 30 researchers on this subject. So, that's not so much. If you look at the number of people working in the biomedical field, that's enormous, that's huge. And, to be honest, I'm also working in the biomedical field. As a side project, I'm working on this cultured meat, because that's what my heart makes, what makes my heart tick as well. But the biomedical field has a lot of funding, whereas the cultured meat, making meat in the lab, that's not so easy yet. So, uh, worldwide, only a few researchers are working on it, and only a few are working full-time because of funding. Now, is this idea new? No, the idea is not new. Winston Churchill, actually in 1932, already said, isn't it absurd to grow a whole animal to use just only a small part of this animal? It should be more efficient to grow just the wings or the breast that you eat in a lab. 
And actually, he predicted that we would do that in 50 years. But if I add up 1932 with 50, I mean 1982, either when I was six years old, I missed it completely, <laughs> or we're not there yet. And we are not there yet. But if we look at the developments that are also uh, due to the developments in the biomedical field, 3D printing, for example, also, if we look at those developments, then we are getting there. So we, are, we have hope to go there. In the Netherlands, actually, so I'm from Eindhoven University, we have collaborated with partners in Amsterdam, Utrecht, and this was all due to a person called Willem van Eelen. He had this idea, he didn't talk to Winston Churchill, but had this idea on his own, that we could culture meat. And he got all those researchers together, and that made this field get a head start. So, indeed, you have the waste of a whole animal, so you only need a few small parts, but there are also other reasons that you can think of why you need an alternative for regular farmed meat. One of them, animal welfare. That's, of course, obvious. The other one, zoonosis, so transmittable diseases between animals and humans, like mad cow disease or uh, the avian flu. You could prevent that by culturing meat in a lab instead of regular farming. And if you look back at the subject yesterday morning, uh, then we can also look at land usage, greenhouse gas emissions, energy use, water usage. If we look at farming of animals, then they use up 30% of all ice-free land. They emit one-fifth of the world's greenhouse gas. And they use a lot of energy, and they use a lot of our fresh water. And looking at the growth of the world population, as also Moses mentioned this morning, we are now at 7 billion people, growing to somewhere between 9 and 11 in 2050. And if we then add up to that the increase in our welfare, that would mean that the world's meat consumption would double by 2050. This is not possible. This is just not possible. So we need an alternative. There are several alternatives. We can all become vegetarians. Or we can go ahead and eat insects. Or we go to cultured meat. And if we compare cultured meat with regular farming of, for example, beef, sheep, pork, poultry, this is a study done by Hannah Tumomisto and Joost Texera. They compared the energy use, greenhouse gas emissions, land use, water use of beef, sheep, pork, poultry with cultured meat. Energy use, there's not so much difference. But if we look into greenhouse gas emissions, land use and water use, with cultured meat we could save a lot of water. We could reduce the use of land enormously, and we could cut down greenhouse gas emissions. So why not go for this? So, yes, we need an alternative, and this alternative could be cultured meat. How do we make cultured meat? We start off, oh, sorry, with the isolation of stem cells from a muscle. So, these are not the stem cells that grow inside of me into a baby at this moment, <laughs> but these are the stem cells that are present in our tissues. So, in an animal, in us, we have stem cells present in virtually all tissues that are used to repair, replace dying cells, 
and those are also present inside the muscle. These we can isolate. Under certain conditions, we can grow them into large numbers of cells. Then, what we can do is give them an environment, so a three-dimensional environment. We call that a scaffold, so it's basically mm, the building blocks. Uh, 3D printing can be used, but also other techniques like using a hydrogel or protein scaffold, whatever, to have the cells attached to and to grow into a tissue. And we need to give them circumstances where the stem cells will become into mature muscle cells. So if we look at the next slide, then we can see those muscle stem cells, we call those satellite cells, and they develop, following a certain path, into mature muscle fibers. And if we look in detail into a muscle, then we see here a muscle, which consists of a bundle of muscle fibers, and in those muscle fibers, we can see what we call sarcomeres. And these are the protein source of a meat. So there's proteins, actin, myosin, and these proteins, what they do, they slide along each other, and that's why we can contract our muscles. That's why an animal can walk, and that's why muscles, meat, have, are such an important protein source for us. So, these I will show you later on in a couple of slides. They are very important for us to show that we have actual muscle tissue, good muscle tissue. So here you see meat, <laughs> in principle. So this is what we can do now, at this moment. So what you see here is a culture plate. One, two pieces of Velcro. We use those as anchoring points, basically to mimic the tendons that connect our muscle to our bone. And in between, here, that's our muscle tissue that's formed. So we put the cells there, with a gel together, and that develops into muscle tissue. And this is about one centimeter long. Two millimeters wide, and only half a millimeter thick. So if you want to have a hamburger or a sausage, you would need a lot of these tissues. <laughs> if we now look in detail, in those muscle tissues, we actually have real muscle tissues. Because we can stain for those sarcomeres that I was talking about, and you can see then these little stripes that happen, so we have nice protein development inside our muscles. And actually, if we stimulate those tissues, they will contract. So we have living, functional, muscle tissues that are able to contract. So, perfect, you would say. At this moment, we can make small muscle tissues of mouse origin. There are a lot of things that we need to do to get into your refrigerator or cooking pot. And one of the issues is that we need to go to farm animal-derived cells. At least in our opinion, in my opinion, in my personal view, I don't think that using mouse tissue will appeal to a lot of people. <laughs> <clears throat> you never know. <laughs> We need to increase the protein content, taste, texture, harvesting, maximum number of stem cells. We need to grow them into large numbers as possible. We need to have our culture conditions animal-free, preferably. Safe biomaterials, maybe using starch, and then 3D print as a basis for our cells. Optimize the number of doublings, upscale, 
industrialized and consumer acceptance. As you may understand, this is not everything that one person can go ahead and work on. So we need to collaborate worldwide with a lot of researchers. But there are three of these subjects that we are working on at this moment. First of all, testing of farm animal derived cells. So we are in collaboration with our co-workers in Utrecht testing pork derived cells. So here you see just a recent tissue that we made from those pork derived cells. We can make a tissue. We are not certain at this moment if we have a perfect muscle. So to be continued. Another important issue is to upscale. So we have these very tiny, small tissues that we can make now, but we want to get bigger. We want to get bigger tissues. So we can either make a sausage or something and put a lot of them together, or make bigger tissues on their own. And for this, we need to use vascularization and perfusion. So if you, uh, maybe you know, but our vessels, also in an animal, in us, uh, they bring oxygen and nutrients to the surrounding tissue. So if the distance to this vessel is too big, then the tissue will die. And the same goes for this culturing. So if the tissue is too big, the center of the tissue will die. So we need to incorporate a vasculature in those tissues and perfuse the medium through it. So here you see in green stained vascular cells. So we are on our way to creating a vascularized tissue. Next step, going bigger, going for perfusion. And last but not least, consumer acceptance. We can use our fancy techniques to make muscle tissues, to make meat. But if the consumer won't accept it, we can use our technology, but we are not getting anywhere. So, in collaboration actually with uh, Kurt van Mensvoort, Cor van der Weele, Melle Stoffelsen, we started some industrial design student projects. And those industrial designers, they make designs, but they also go and do research. What do consumers want? So do they need a burger? Do they need something completely different? So they're going to study this. So here you see two design examples. One is knitted meat. So I once told a student that it would be possible to make long threads of meat. And he thought, OK, then I can make patterns from that. But maybe 3D printing is easier. <laughs> and another student had magic balls. So his idea was target to children, because children are the future generation. If you have nice colors, fancy colors, that will be attractive to children. I don't know if that will work or that it would be just a hamburger, but future will tell us. So right now, we're here. In future, hopefully, we'll go there. But this is not what you do on your own. There are a lot of people that do work in the lab, a lot of collaborators to look into all these different areas. Thank you. I, I can understand, Daisy, why governments would be a little cautious about supporting this kind of research. But why, why aren't the meat companies all over this? I would think you would get a tremendous amount of support from the commercial world. I would hope so, but uh, I don't know. I think the, the animal industry is very, very strong. And uh, also with industry, they want to see profits coming out of it very soon. Mm. And I don't know if they see the profit coming out of this in five years already, and if they are willing to wait a bit longer for it to 
uh, get there. Mm -hmm. That was going to be my next question, which is how, how fast is all this moving? How fast is this moving? That, yeah. that depends on how much people we can put on this. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's uh, one of our previous collaborators, he's working on making a hamburger. I've heard that, so, that he will eat this fall, right? And it will be this fall, November, I think, and that's the goal. And about quality or whatever, but maybe that will be a turning point for funding also. Where will this so, be done? Where it will be yeah. done? Yeah, where will he eat? I don't meat. know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure it'll be widely covered. Yeah, Thank you yeah. so much Thank for coming you. all this okay, way. Okay, you're welcome. Yeah.